Well, good afternoon to all of our coaches, athletes, friends, anybody that's joining our podcast this afternoon. I'm Mike Haggerty, and I'm alongside with Mike Clayton. I guess it's our version of the Mike and Mike show on the Heads Up Coaches Council podcast. Uh, and I hope everybody gets that sort of catchy name, Heads Up, right? That That's sort of a big deal. Keep that head up. <laughs> elbows in, right? Uh, well, we've got a, a very special guest with us today. One of the very mm. best and the best in the business. And uh, last week we had Bruce Baumgartner. Uh, this week at Steve Frazier. Uh, Mike, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what we're going to have after this because uh, we're hitting the two very best right out of the shoot. But Steve, it's really great to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, guys. Good morning. How are you? All is good here. Uh, Mike, I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, I know that you've got a very special relationship with Steve, and you've probably been saving up for this one to, to anchor some of these questions. Uh, I've got a few of my own, but I'm going to let you kick this one off, and uh, let's start digging deep on Steve Frazier and what he brings to the table today. It's not every day that uh, a small, skinny kid from uh, southeast Iowa can hang out with an Olympic gold medalist every day. And uh, after getting to USA Wrestling in 2014, we wanted to take a motor motorcycle trip to Fargo. A lot of guys in the office were riding bikes. And Steve was the only guy that I could get to commit to riding, uh, being crazy enough to ride our motorcycles. So we did some wrestling clinics in Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota as we rode our way out. And uh, on the way back, I, we were sleeping and camping and some snake holes everywhere. And middle of the night, I hear what I know it was a snake. And so I grab a machete that I carry on my motorcycle and I'm about to come down on this snake. And all of a sudden, Steve goes, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, Shh, there's a snake. I'm going to get this snake. And he's like, that's my arm. I'm reaching for a water bottle. So my first <laughs> official job at USA Wrestling, I almost chopped off Steve's uh, arm. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a memorable one. <laughs> he hasn't held that against me too much since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was a fun trip. That was a good trip. Uh, that's pretty cool. So uh, for our fans and, and guests out there, 84 Olympic gold medalist Steve Frazier, our first Olympic gold medal in Greco-Roman wrestling. Um, how is that? Like, what, what got you into Greco? Because I know you had a pretty successful career on the international level in freestyle as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wrestled all three styles my, in my career. But um, the way I got started in Greco was Masaki Hata. Uh, a lot of people know Tadaki Hata. Masaki's his older brother and the world silver medalist from Japan. I think he won a silver medal in 1968, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, he was one of my high school coaches and... Uh, in the spring, between my sophomore and junior year, he, he he and a couple other wrestlers, they, they talked me into going around wrestling some freestyle and Greco in the summer. And so he's the one that introduced me to my first Greco tournament in Michigan. That's and awesome. I, and I loved it. I loved it right off the bat. Steve, let's take it back a little ways. I know everybody's always interested in guys that have become Olympians, Olympic champions. Uh, what really, what fed you into the sport? What got you started in your early career and what did that look like? Well, again, it was, <clears throat> I was in the eighth grade when I started wrestling and my, my gym teacher kept trying to get me to come out for wrestling, uh, Webb Junior High School. And uh, I used to tell him, yeah, 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 coach, I'll come out. I'll, or he's a wrestling coach and gym teacher. And I used to say, yeah, yeah, I'll come out, I'll come out. But I never, never went up. Finally, one day, <clears throat> Frank Stagg was his name. He grabbed me in the hallway and he got me in a sleeper hold, you know, around the back <laughs> of the neck. And, and, and as he was lovingly choking me, he said, Frazier, I want to see you at practice tonight. And of course, I happily agreed you know okay okay and i went up to practice and uh, again i loved it right from the start i loved the sport of wrestling i loved the physicalness of it i loved the sweat that you got from it <clears throat> and um, i love the strategy part of it i wasn't very good when i first started but um you know but then through his great coaching and other great coaches that i was blessed with through my early days I became, you know, pretty decent at it.
Steve, I think if I remember right, there was sort of a flip with you and Mike Houck and and how you came about into the USA wrestling circles as a head coach for the national team. Uh, can you fill us in a little bit on how that took place and what brought you into USA wrestling as our national team's coach? Yeah, so I was with Domino's Pizza for 10 years and, uh, <clears throat> you know, working in, in operations and running pizza stores for Domino's at the time. Uh, and Mike was the national coach. And um, uh, at the time, uh, I forget what year it was, in 95, I think, uh, he was making a move from wrestling. He, he was going to leave as the national coach. And he actually called me and said, Steve, I'm, I'm going to be leaving. Uh, might you be interested in the job? And it just so happened at that period of my life, I was doing a lot of thinking about wrestling. You know, I'd been in the business world and the pizza business world for a while. And, and so I'm like, yeah, yeah. Anyways, uh, long story short, uh, Mike, um, <clears throat> I interviewed with Mitch Hall and Jim Shear and, and, uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to leave the business world, and uh, but I did. But I, I went and talked to my vice president, the, co uh, the, the guy I worked for at Domino's, and it was the year before the Olympics, the '96 Olympics. So I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about exploring this uh, coaching job. What do you think? You know, and and he made it easy for me. He's like, Steve, uh, why don't you go do it for a year through the Olympics, and if you love it wonderful if you don't like it i'll bring you right back and put you right in the same spot so you won't lose any ground at dominoes um and so uh yeah so he made it easy for me to, to take the job and of course i took it and never looked back and then the switch was mike howe just happened to be looking for to do something different as well and so i connected him with the people at dominoes and he ended up entering the management training program at Domino's uh, where he actually moved to Ann Arbor where I left from. So we switched cities and he was with Domino's for, for quite a while. So that, that actually happened. We switched companies at the same time. That's a wild story. And, and, and not as, as you moved on with your career, Steve, um, what was it that, that, really helped you connect with the, the Greco program, USA Wrestling. Um, what was it that, that once you were in it, what what drew you even closer in becoming a longtime coach, a world team coach, uh, just some outstanding seasons in the Greco program? What, 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 what attracted you to hold you in it that long? Well, I love it. I mean, I love wrestling, first of all. And of course, I love Greco. Uh, like I said earlier, I wrestled all three styles my whole career. But I always seemed to do better in Greco. Even though I was a national champion in freestyle, the year I won the Olympics in Greco. And I was actually second in Greco in the Nationals in, the, in, uh, in 1984. I, I lost to Mike Houck. And uh, so anyways, um, yeah, I just love the sport. And, of course, I love competition and I loved coaching. You know, being a Domino's for 10 years, I learned how to try to motivate people and coach them and teach them. And, and uh, of course, all that relates right to athletics, too. So, yeah, I guess that's why I did it for almost 19 years. I've got one more, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike. I, real quick, Steve, the question that I have for you is that, to me, that Greco, it's a tough man sport. Not that freestyle, not that folk style isn't a tough man sport, but it just seems to be a higher level of intensity of, in, of just toughness that goes with Greco. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? I know that, uh, you know, I, being out at the Olympic Training Center and being around some of the national team guys, just watching some of the practices and being in the room, the intensity that Greco brings, it just it's, it seems a little different. What is that? What, what, what's, it, what's that all about? Well, they're all tough, right? <clears throat> they're all they're all uh, extremely tough in their own ways. <clears throat> I would never say Greco was tougher than freestyle as far as that goes, but the reason it, it seems tougher, I would say, is because it's chest to chest. You're you're in contact with your opponent, <clears throat> you know, ninety nine percent of the time. Where in freestyle, you're you know you're bouncing around, disconnected with each other for part of 
the, the wrestling match. You know, you're connected a lot, too, with hand fighting and so forth and tying up. But um, in Greco, it's all chest to chest. So in that regard, it is intense, more intense. It's physical, like nonstop, chest to chest, pummeling, underhooking, snapping, locking, physical actions. And that's appealing to you? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess it is, yeah. I mean, the funny thing is I wrestled freestyle and and <clears throat> and um I really didn't change my style that much. I mean, I, I wrestled the, almost the exact same personal style. I was a lot of upper body with freestyle and a lot of pummeling and underhooking and snapping and you know, of course, I I did leg attacks too and freestyle, like foot sweeps and and so forth. But but I was never a huge double leg or single leg guy, uh, and um, so I didn't really have to switch my personal style too much going back and forth between the two styles. I can date myself because I remember you wrestling freestyle, Steve, and I do remember those matches. Seems to me, and things change with time, but seems to me that I remember a lot of underhooks. A lot of front headlocks, a, a lot yeah. of duck unders, things that you could easily transfer into the Greco world, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so much upper body stuff that that really helped me to become a successful freestyle wrestler. You know, the, the, the nice thing about upper body skills in freestyle is you can, you can virtually um, stop your opponent from most of their attack with underhooks and and that kind of stuff so um you know if i if i wrestled a great double leg person you you got to believe that person it, it, my goal was never to let that person be away from me i was always going to be underhooking them tying them up snapping them pushing them pulling them arm dragging them <clears throat> that kind of thing so that there was never any too, too much space between the two of us and of course what helped me personally in freestyle too uh uh, is, uh, you know, you have to be good at, at, at leg defense, you know, double leg defense. And so I became pretty uh, good, if I say so myself, at defending leg attacks. If someone got a single leg on me or double leg, jamming the head down and, and sprawling and jamming the guy, that became a, a, a strong uh, skill for me. So I could stop a lot of, uh, a lot of shots. How much did your skills as an athlete transfer over to your coaching style once you took over on the national team? Probably all of it. I mean, I, I tried to. So my my personal style, <clears throat> again, I say I say this, guys, with all humility. So, um, but my personal style of wrestling was a very intense, in your face um, style. And uh, attacking, attacking a lot, and the grinding. You know, gr uh, I prided myself being in great physical condition. You know, cardiovascular condition. Uh, prided myself in being able to out wrestle everybody and with conditioning. Um, <clears throat> and um, so that mentality that I developed through my years of wrestling, of course, it becomes your mentality. And so with most everything I did, whether I was at Domino's running 65 Domino's pizza stores or whether I was uh, coaching the U.S. national team, I had the same mentality, one that uh, that was a, kind of a grinding in your face, always attacking, aggressive, moving forward, uh, great shape mentality. And I, and I learned that, and you know this, Mike, because you did that interview with Mark Chirella recently. I learned a lot of that from Mark Chirella. We used to do grind matches before I called them grind matches. Uh, and, uh, and that's how I really developed a lot of great uh, intensity skills in your face, always attacking, always moving type skills. How did the athletes feel about that grind match mentality? I mean, I can't imagine when you take over coaching, we haven't had a whole lot of success necessarily in Greco. Like we didn't have a lot of, you know, a ton of champs and stuff like that. But 
all of a sudden you walk in and, and now you've got a room full of athletes that may or may not buy into that mentality. How, how did you create that culture of intensity that, that helped to go on to win a 2007 world title? Well, you know, to create a culture, it, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's, um, I'll try to sum it up. Um, creating a culture is really the key in my opinion to, um, having success um, as a coach or, or with your team, you have to create a, a really positive, strong, intense culture. Uh, one that's one that includes a lot of <clears throat> very hard work, uh, but also includes a lot of fun. And, you know, a lot of people might not think <clears throat> that you can work really hard and have fun, but I beg to differ that you can. You can have fun training very hard, and uh, but it's just that mentality. You have to, you have to uh, walk the walk, talk to talk, walk the walk, and and so, you know, in reality, who knows if? <clears throat> I mean, I, I always had confidence that we could be good in Greco, you know, because we have the great athletes, you know, <clears throat> but we were so far behind the world in in technique and. And, and experience, it was going to take some hard work. So, um, so I believe that we could do it. But, um, you know, really what it takes is getting everyone else to believe. And so the way you do that is you got to tell them every day and you got to act it. And you got to believe it. And you can't fake it. You got to truly believe it because people will see right through if you're trying to fake something. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it's just acting like you could be champion. And then of course, what helped us, I got us together with all the foreigners. I brought foreigners here all the time. Team, Sweden, Turkey, Russia, Japan, uh, you know, all kinds of different Cuba, you know, and, uh, and it's that getting those, those our best uh, toughest opponents in the same room with our guys um, <clears throat> helped, helped, uh, help them to build the confidence through either getting their butts kicked a while and then getting tired of that and stepping up and starting to kick some butt <clears throat> or just learning the stuff from their opponents, you know, so taking the kind of mystique away from these guys as well, the, the you know, our foreign opponents. Steve, can we get back there to where we were in 2007? And if we can, I guess my question would be, what will it take? How far are we away what, where are we at with Greco right now? Oh, we can get back there for sure. No question about it. You know, Matt Linden, national coach, and Gary Mayhab uh, and um, Mohammed, uh, <clears throat> I think they're doing a good job. In our country, um, you know, it takes, let's face it, we are not a Greco country. Never have been and probably never will be uh, 100%. But, um, it takes overcoming some other challenges that we have, you know, and getting more and more Greco guys to, to stay in Greco. And to be quite frank with you, I'm not blaming anyone or freestyle or anything, you know, but with the, with the regional training centers all over the country now, that incentivizes uh, a lot of would-be Greco guys um, to stay wrestling freestyle because they stay in the regional training center, they get paid. They get some incentives. They get to stay home with their girlfriends or their wives or their families and train with their 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 college uh, team that they that they uh, competed with as a college uh, athlete. And so that has made it a little tougher for Greco because it's harder to get the guys that used to be really good in Greco through high school. They go to college and they and they wrestle college for four or five years and they still do some Greco in spring and summer. And now they come back to Greco once they graduate college. That, uh, you know, happens less now. <clears throat> what so do we need to do? I, I so much appreciate that response. And the other thing I would ask is, knowing a lot of the folks in, in our area, in the Kansas City area in particular, and even nationwide, uh, there seems to be maybe a bit of a fear factor either entering Greco for athletes, 
coaches may be afraid to introduce it at the club level. Uh, th their knowledge of folk style transfers over to freestyle a little bit more. Uh, what do we need to tell these coaches uh, in order to get them more in line and comfortable with um, working Greco into their programs, working Greco into their clubs? You know, that's a that's a really good question. And it's been a question for, you know, for the last 25 years since I've been back with USA Wrestling. <clears throat> We've been preaching and talking about the benefits of Greco to college coaches and high school coaches uh, for 25 years. 25 years we've been preaching that. It's very, what I've come to find out after 25 years of trying to convince people, it's difficult. Coaches, a lot of coaches know what they know. They're good with what they're good with. And, they're, and, and a lot of them aren't so apt to expand and try to really delve into Greco because they're they're afraid of it because they don't know as much about it as they do folk style or freestyle. And it's easy for them to just stay the path, stay the path of, with what they know. That's that's the only thing I can really say because, I mean, come on. The, for 25 years, we've been doing all kinds of things trying to convince people. Greco's good. Greco's good. It helps with this. It helps. When push comes to shove, a college coach is measured on whether he wins the NCAA or places high or gets NCAA All-Americans or not. And they feel, I'm assuming, they feel that they got to spend their time, the limited time they have, teaching their kids the skills that are going to help them win uh, in college at the NCAA. And they don't necessarily see as, you know, learning upper body techniques, uh, especially if they're not that familiar with them themselves, you know, they don't see spending a lot of time in that as a good way to spend the time. You That's know what's exciting, what's really exciting to me is like going out to the training center, arguably, you know, uh, let's say half the time is devoted towards freestyle orientation for our developmental camps, half the time towards Greco. Uh, and, and I'm definitely leaning towards, you know, working more with the freestyle guys. And I look <laughs> over my shoulder, lo and behold, the kids are most fired up about Greco. They love to learn Greco. They love to pick guys up and throw guys. They love the fact that they're learning new strategies, new techniques. It would be sweet if we could believe that we could somehow create that same excitement in the clubs when they get back home. Because you definitely see it at the training center that uh, I think the guys are most excited about the Greco sessions. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is something that's really fun and cool about throwing people, right? And um it's exciting and fun and, and, you know, it's so it much gets, the landing, but the, the throwing is real yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and you see that, I mean, even if you go to the Olympic games, a lot of times <clears throat> the, the fans, again, not take it anything away from freestyle. I love freestyle is great, but there's something about throwing people that brings fans to their feet, you know? And so, <clears throat> so it's cool. But, um, but again, let's face it, kids are influenced by the by the people that they're surrounded with daily. And if and if I didn't have Masaki Hata taking me to my first Greco tournament, he wasn't a Greco wrestler, he was a freestyle silver medalist. If I wouldn't have had him taking me there and and encouraging me in Greco, <clears throat> you know, I wouldn't have been a Greco wrestler probably. Who knows, you know? So it's it's a tough Again, not blaming anybody. It's it's the culture, it's the wrestling culture we have in the United States of America. You go to Russia, it's different. The Greco is maybe number one there. You know, freestyle is pretty number one too in Russia. But a lot of those Eastern Bloc countries, Greco is the number one sport, and freestyle is the number two. So uh, we just have special challenges here. I mean, it's been that way. It's going to be that way forever probably who knows <clears throat> but um we can overcome it we proved it we won the world title we proved we can be the best in the world that means we can do it again
I heard when you interviewed for the job, Jim Shear had a comment to everybody before they hired you that kind of puts you on top of that job. You, Well, it's funny because Rich, 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 Jim never told me this, but Rich told it to me uh, years later. When I interviewed, you know, I came in with a plan and, you know, goals and here's what I think we can do. And, and uh, I guess that when the interview was over, uh, Jim Shear told Rich Bender and Mitch Hall that uh, I think I think he said something like, "Dang, we gotta hire we gotta hire Frazier as our Nash coach. He 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 really thinks we can win in Greco." Meaning they didn't he didn't even believe it that we could win in Greco. So um, <clears throat> yeah, it's been the it's been our story our story forever in Greco. We're always you know, the redheaded stepchild sort of uh, in, in wrestling in, our, in, the, in this country. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. You got you to gotta take what's, what it is and figure out how to win. Steve, tell us a little bit about your book. What inspired you when you wrote your book? And, and what was your message? My book? Yeah. And shameless not, ad, shameless oh, prop here. <laughs> I just don't, I just happen to have one right here. I swear, I swear, I didn't plan that. But uh, my book, Victory, <clears throat> let's see, Victory, um, being tough, being mentally tough on and off the mat, um, you know, what inspired me is, is Mike Chapman asked me to write a column for Win Magazine. And so I am a ham and egg writer, man. I was not one of my best skills and uh, I was really reluctant, but he said, I'll do it, you know you know, whatever, just try it and blah, blah, blah. It'll, it'll help you become a better writer, which it did. So I started writing a column for Win Magazine. <clears throat> um, so I was writing probably about, I, I think they were, back then it was eight issues a year or something, maybe 10. I can't remember. But um, that's how I started writing. And um, after I did that for about three or four or five years, um, Mike Chapman even suggested maybe I write a book and use some of those columns, you know, take from some of those columns. So anyway, so that's kind of what I did. I had a, I had a desire to write a book and share some, some of the story of my wrestling life and other, and my athletes wrestling life. And so I wrote the book and uh, that's it. Victory. So how does somebody get one of your books if they don't have one? Um, they can reach out to me. Uh, I, I, I had my website is down right now because of COVID and uh, I had to shut my camps down for a summer and I probably will do. I'm not doing them again this summer, <clears throat> but um, yeah, they can reach out to me at, you, you know, at my email, uh, Frazier at USA and uh, I can, send them a book and tell them how they can get one. I've heard even young kids that have, have read through your book that just really find a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of direction or a lot of motivation from it. Um, was that kind of the intent as you were putting all those articles together or like where, where was the book supposed to take people? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the whole, this whole book is, 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 is based around the mental aspect of the game. And um, so how to be mentally tough in wrestling. Um, and it was designed for, you know, probably a little bit older audience not, than young, young kids, you know. But, um, but, um, <clears throat> but it was just sharing some of, the, some of the mental toughness aspects of wrestling. And, um, and uh, yeah, so that's what it is. The, the, the nice thing about this book is, it doesn't, it doesn't just help wrestlers. And I say this, you know, again, with all humility, it's a book that if you're not even in wrestling, the, the concepts, mental toughness concepts that you uh, will learn or will be exposed to by reading this book will help you in your personal endeavors, whether it be in business or, or with whatever field you're in. So Mental toughness is mental toughness. You know, I, I use the same mental toughness as an athlete as, as I did as a coach, you know, as I do as a fundraiser. 
Steve, what do our, our young coaches out there that are uh, coaching Greco right now, what qualities, what do they need to be bringing to the table to their athletes to get them to the to the highest level that they can? I mean, what is it that, that excited you uh, other than you, your love for the sport, which obviously grew over time, but th these young kids that are starting and dabbling in Greco and you've got young coaches uh, in the clubs, what would you tell these guys? What would you tell them in, in regards to uh, what you learned from your journey that they might learn? What, what you would, what the coaches would tell the, the kids or what's the, yeah. What would, what, what would the coaches, what do they need to bring to the table to help inspire these young guys to maybe stay in the sport a little bit longer uh, and, and enjoy the ride? Well, I mean, obviously in our sport, it is very tough as we all know. So you have to, you have to make the, the sport fun. Um, to keep young kids inspired and involved, it has to be fun, I believe. And um, so, uh, teaching them how to how to have fun with the sport, and uh, and how to uh, train your bodies, and learn the skills and so forth that it takes to be a good wrestler, but at the same time having fun doing that, I think is the biggest thing. If I had to sum it all up, what I would teach a coach is. A young coach or a coach that's teaching young kids is you got to cre make a, a, a create a culture again in the practice room that is hardworking, but it's fun and it's teaching. It's putting the two connected together. How can hard work and fun be in the same sentence? They can. Working hard, I, to, to this day, the most fun that I used to have, I'm telling, I'm honest when I say this would be the fun when I'd leave the wrestling room completely drenched in sweat, barely able to lift my arms because I'm so exhausted. I go in the shower and the shower stings my skin because it's raw. That became fun for me. And people might think, well, what? he's crazy, you know. But no, it was fun for me because I knew what I was doing was helping me to become better and better as a wrestler. So... <clears throat> Um, I would say having fun is the most important thing. A couple years ago, uh, Coach Haggerty, uh, Steve and I are doing a clinic. And uh, the night before the clinic, I walk into the wrestling room, the shower area, and Steve's just getting done wrestling with uh, one of our buddies that was running the clinic. And uh, this guy's face is just, you know, scratches and black and blue. And, you know, the guy's got to run the clinic the next day. And he's like, look at me. He said, I'm, I'm destroyed. And I kind of looked at Steve and he was kind of like, mess with the bull, you get the horns, right? It, it was like almost like not a big deal and, and almost like he wasn't even aware that he kind of did it. Steve, when we were talking about that the other day, almost kind of like that, that next gear, that next level that once, right, even, you know, even years after you stopped coaching, you know, you're, you're in the room wrestling with this guy and, and that kind of intensity comes out. Um, what is it about that intensity that, where does it come from? And, and how does it, how do you sustain that? Because obviously this is something, you still ride enduro motorcycles, you know, you've got a lot of adventures in your life. What is it about you that, that has that kind of tipping point of either adventure or toughness or, or accomplishment? Where does that come from? Well, you know, I don't know. It comes from training, you know, it, 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 it comes from developing a mentality, you know? I mean, do you think Jordan Burroughs wants to beat everybody by one point? No, he wants to crush everybody, everybody. He wants to 10 point every single person that steps in front of him. It's a mentality. And you develop that mentality through practice, just like you develop a double leg or a headlock. And again, I was fortunate, as you know, Mike, because you did the interview with Mark Trella. Mark was, Mark Trella, three-time NCAA champion, was a mentor of mine, a training partner, teammate at Michigan. He was one year older than me, and he, him and I training together for two-hour matches, two-hour, we didn't call them grind matches. That's just what we did. We wrestled for two hours straight without stopping, no drinks, nothing hardly, you know, and you develop, and when you got Mark Trella kicking the crud out of you when you're young and you're first learning, you either sink or swim. You either quit wrestling him. Or you start to figure out how to 
get him back with his own stuff and stay in there, you know? And so that, <laughs> that's it. That's mentality. That's developing your brain to be like, I'm not quitting. He, he kicked my butt for the last half hour. I get on top of him. I'm putting Mark Trell freaking power half on him and I'm going to crank his butt over with his own freaking move. I'm tired of him kicking the crap out of me. And then, you know, the more you do that, the more, you know, you get better. I don't hey. know if that answers, I don't know if that answered your question, but. I think it's a peek through the window for sure. Yeah. I mean, mentality is, is uh, everything. Burroughs wants to beat everybody by 10 points. And so does, so does everybody, every good wrestler. They don't just want to win. They want to crush people, you know. Steve, you mentioned uh, earlier as well uh, a lot, and you brought this theme throughout this um, interview, talked a lot about having fun. And one of the things that it caught my eye that the Greco team uh, oftentimes is engaged with fun activities during practice, before, after practice, certain days just maybe playing dodgeball or something in the room and keeping it light. Um, Tying that into the concept of recovery, how much time do you feel has to be spent on hard intensity, just going tough in the practice room versus those days where you have to come in and recover because it is such a tough grinding sport? Uh, how did you see that as a national teams coach and how would you reflect that towards um, some of our younger coaches today? So Mike, that's a really, really good question because you know, we all, we all talk about hard work, hard work, hard work. And, it, and we all know as wrestling coaches, it takes hard work to become a good wrestler and to have a championship team. But it also is just as important to have hard recovery. And I say hard recovery, that's equal recovery. And I'm not saying 50-50, you know, we don't have time to go into a periodization strategy here unless you guys want to, but Periodization is, is how you're peaking for the main event at the end of the year. And in different phases of the of the of the season, your 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 periodization calls for different types of training. And anyways, it always includes um, my training always included active rest and real rest. And uh, without so tearing down your body through hard work and training does just that. It tears down your body, makes it tired. You lift a lot of weights, your muscles get really tired. Where the growth takes place is when you're resting. When you rest those muscles, now they grow, they, they repair, they strengthen because they're like, this idiot's going to put us through this workout again coming up here. We got to build and get stronger so that we can take it. And then what do we do as coaches or athletes? We we work harder and tear down the muscles again. And then our body recovers again. So active rest and rest is really important. <clears throat> and that's a really uh, an important part of a coach's responsibility is to, <clears throat> is to understand the relationship between extreme hard work and active rest, you know. So, yeah, so, you know, for, for, for is a general kind of a training schedule, really general, uh, you know, we tried to train, I, we tra train two, two times a day at least, Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday was always our active rest where we did some basketball or some activity off the mat, <clears throat> one practice and like then the afternoon was off rest completely and then thursday friday two practices two practices and then saturday active rest one practice something fun outside soccer whatever frisbee football uh swimming and then sunday rest day of rest uh as a general rule that <clears throat> that is a in my mind a, a general good training schedule hard monday tuesday with with four practices, two and two, Wednesday active rest, hard Thursday, Friday, Saturday active rest, Sunday completely off. And that's certainly not real conducive to a lot of ways that 
uh, the typical clubs can train, nor high schools or even colleges when they train wrestlers <laughs> not specific to Greco. But it's difficult to train that way simply because you have such a compressed season and everybody's trying to get as much practice time in as you possibly can. Um, I guess, you know, with our national team uh, being a little bit different that you can focus on, you know, those specific international and national events and target those. And so you can build those training schedules around that. I, I guess where I'm going with this is, do you believe that to some extent uh, we overtrain in our sport? Is that something that we do frequently in maybe the other sides, disciplines of folk style, freestyle, et cetera? Uh, no, I don't think we tend to overtrain. I mean, I, I think you can overtrain and some coaches maybe uh, make mistakes and overtrain their athletes at times. But keep in mind that schedule, that general, very general schedule I just said, that's what we did at the University of Michigan when I was in charge of training. Mm -hmm. So you can do it in college. Now, you you, you know, our, pra our, our morning, early morning was in between classes or or before classes started. And then our afternoon practice was hard. So we still did two a day on Monday and Tuesday. And then active rest. And when I introduced the active rest to Dale Barr at University of Michigan, he was very skeptical. What do you mean? We're not going to be on the mat on Wednesdays? No, we're going we're gonna to play a game on Wednesdays. Well, what, what do you mean? But he put me in charge of conditioning. He said, if anybody is out of shape during the year, I'm looking right at you from the bench if anybody gasses in a match. And I said, oh, good, I'll take that responsibility. So um, <clears throat> so anyways, you can do it. I, I don't think I, think, I think overtraining can be a problem. And here again, we're overtraining. If you're talking about a general periodization schedule, Mike Haggerty, is early in the college season or high school season, you're having long practices, two hours. There are a lot of learning techniques. There's a lot of base conditioning going on, grind matches, you know, our two hour mat grind matches. Uh, then as the mid season comes, you're shortening practices down to say like an hour and a half. And it's, everything's getting higher intensity, faster wrestling. Instead of running distance, you're running more intervals or some sprints. Um, weightlifting is now being less important a little bit in the, in, in the mid stage of the, periodization calendar and then when you want to peak for the NCAA of the state championship now you're only having one hour practices they're short they're sweet they're very high intensity sprint wrestling pummel matches you're sprinting you know your running is now sprinting and not long distance everything is high intensity and short why why in short? Why do you think that's in short? Short does what for the peak? Helps aid recovery. Short helps the recovery. Short helps your mental. What makes you tired mentally? Two hour practices, all oh, listening to the coach, ah, da, 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 doing this, drilling that, da, da, da. That's tiring here. You, our practice is right before the last three weeks before the NCAA or the, or the state or the world championships, 45 minutes, maybe in bam, fast out, good warm up, fast, high intensity sprints, bam, recover out of the room, go shop with your girlfriend shopping, go walk in the park, you know, um, and then that the idea is that freshens the mind, it lets the mind refresh, so that when you actually come to the NCAA championships or the world championships, you're actually hungry. You're actually wanting to go out there and mix it up because you're like hungry for the fight. You're not, oh God, I can't wait. Two more weeks and this season's over. God, I can't wait till baseball season starts. I'm tired. When we were traveling around uh, on that Fargo trip, you would show your gold medal to a lot of the athletes and you would talk to them about what it took you to get there and some of the challenges that you had when you walked into the Michigan room and um, even to the point where you weren't sure you were going to stay with the program. Could you kind of share a little bit of that story? I, I, I know the impact that it had on me getting an opportunity to hear it. Well, you know, winning the Olympics, uh, Mike Clayton, was a dream come true. So, um you know, I feel I feel really 
blessed and fortunate. You know, I'm average Joe, Hazel Park, Michigan. I wasn't, I don't have that many great natural skills uh, physically or whatever. Um, but um, so sharing that, that medal or that victory, I mean, it's always fun for me because I mean, the main message, message that I hope I, that I share with young people is that, hey, if I did this, anyone can do it. So, you know, if you have a dream to, to, to win a medal like this gold medal, blah, blah, believe you can do it because you can. I, I totally believe that anyone can, can achieve if they really want it bad enough and they're willing to, you know, and they're willing to pay the price, you know, and learn how to make it fun. Steve, so. your new role. What about your new role with fundraising? We're getting close to the end of the, the podcast. So uh -huh. I want to give you a chance to speak a little bit on uh, your new role with USA Wrestling and what you've been doing the last couple of years in regards to fundraising, et cetera. Yeah, so I love fundraising. Um, <clears throat> you know, basically fundraising is, is, uh, is relationship building with, with uh, people that love the sport of wrestling. And so it's been really fun for me to be involved with fundraising for about the last five years. And um, the, the, the great thing about fundraising in wrestling is that we have so many, so many very generous, uh, kind uh, people out there that have, that have had success in business and finance and so forth. And, um, they truly believe that the sport of wrestling, for the, for the ones that have wrestled, which is most of them, they believe that the sport of wrestling was the key component of them being successful in business. And they attribute their success in business to the things they learned in wrestling, like the discipline, like making sacrifices, like getting the job done, no matter what, you know. And, um, and so that's been really fun because even through the pandemic, tough times for everybody, no doubt. Um, we've had, our, you know, uh, most of our wonderful supporters have stuck with us and, and, uh, and continued to support uh, all the programs at USA Wrestling that their generous dollars go, go for. So fundraising has been fun. I, I love it. Mike, anything else before we close it up? No, thanks a lot, Steve. It's always great to get a chance to share some time and uh, hopefully our weather will turn a little bit warmer and not quite two feet of snow like we're getting this weekend. We can get back out on the bikes. Yeah, I'm wondering. I don't see it snowing yet, but it's supposed to snow a couple feet here. So we'll see. I just yeah. I think we're supposed to get a little rain back here in the Midwest, but uh, not not near the snow that you guys are supposed to get. But Steve, I can't thank you enough. It's always an honor, a pleasure to to listen to you, give us some insights on your career, uh, both as an athlete, a coach, and now in your new role at USA Wrestling. So much appreciate you and what you've done over the years. Uh, we've got some really exciting wrestling going on right now. We're getting ready for the, obviously the NCAA championships in St. Louis, just down the road from me, about three and a half hours. So, uh, looking forward to seeing the NCAAs and we've got our Olympic trials coming up the first week in, uh, April. So lots of stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the NCAAs, I'll say go blue. As far go as, blue. As <laughs> far as the Olympic trials. Yeah. The trials, the Olympic trials are going to be the event of the, of the century maybe you know with the you know with the matchups that are going to take place there uh in fort worth it's going to be an event that uh dang i hope everyone can experience yeah absolutely well again mike thanks for joining on and and steve again thank you so much and uh thanks to all of our coaches and athletes and friends that have joined us on heads up today and we'll be back in a couple more weeks after this talk to you later bye -bye. all right thank you thanks steve bye-bye